So uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of you from uh, here just near London in the UK. Uh, welcome to another Ebenem webinar. Um, as you probably know, some of the regulars that uh, we've seen on a number of these, thanks for coming back. Um, these webinars are focused on self-sovereign identity and digital credentials. Um, we run these webinars uh, regularly. If you look back at ebenem.com slash web webinars, you'll see a, a whole set of the previous ones. Um, we want to help you learn faster and build more efficiently. On our last webinar, um, Alan Murray Hayden from IATA came on to tell us all about the IATA Travel Pass initiative. Um, Travel Pass is in live trials right now. and It's going to be used by airlines around the world to open up global travel again. Um, it was our best attended webinar so far, and we all know why, don't we? Um, you can't really watch the news these days without some speculation of when the nightmare will be over and we can all start getting back to something sort of normal. Um, it's looking more and more like digital methods for verifying your COVID test or vaccine status will play a vital part in this return to normality. And there are several initiatives underway at the moment. IATA Travel Pass uses Evanim's technology with digital verifiable credentials, giving each passenger a self-sovereign identity uh, that they manage and control. Uh, there's other initiatives using other methods as well, but the key to success to all of these initiatives will be the privacy and security of the people, the participants, and the ability for airlines, border guards, restaurants, cruise lines, uh, whoever it may be, to verify the authenticity and integrity of the data they receive from people so they can trust it and they know that it's genuine. So in this new world of digital verification, it's vital to get privacy right. And that's the topic of this webinar. You know, health information is, is one of the most sensitive data types that exist. Nobody will trust a system that plays fast and loose with data like this. For global acceptance, privacy and respect for the individual, um, that has to be built in at the highest levels from day one. And to talk about this, uh, this key issue that's going to affect all of us, you know, we've assembled a, a fantastic panel of distinguished guests for you today. Um, we've got Christine, Chris, Evi and Drummond, and they have um, you know, between them a deep experience across the technology and scaling side of things at a global level, um, healthcare provision and operations, medical strategy, compliance regulation, as well as governance and trust. So uh, we couldn't wish for a better panel. So I'd just like to introduce them all now. Um, folks, if you can just uh, jump off mute and uh, onto your video, that would be cracking. And I'll come firstly, Christine, to yourself. Can you give us a quick intro, please? Sure. Uh, Christine Liao. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me on the webinar. I'm uh, the global lead in Accenture for uh, decentralized identity and biometrics and uh, excited to be talking to all of you. Great. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, Chris, on to yourself. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Ingrail. I'm responsible for strategy and operations at Lumetic. Uh, Lumetic is a technology company focused on providing software to improve the way patients access, understand, and pay for their healthcare. And we're doing that leveraging verifiable credentials. Uh, in addition to the software, late last year, we collaborated uh, with Providence, MasterCard, Cambia, and a few others uh, to launch a community focus completely on developing interoperability standards uh, around uh, healthcare credentials. Um, I live in Seattle with my wife and my six-year-old daughter, uh, and it's a beautiful sunny day, and I'm excited to be here with you all. Thanks very much, Chris. We've got to get the weather reports in on these things, haven't we? <laughs> um, and um, Evie, next. Um, are you with us, Evie? And did you get connected okay? Yes, yes I did. How are you doing? Sorry about that. I was a, just uh, got here in the nick of time. So no I, um, I'm Evie Cunningham. I am an OBGYN physician by training, but I've been sucked into the vortex of uh, healthcare leadership. And I have a very strong passion for applied technologies and innovation in healthcare. So recently joined a team um, in Providence with the corporate development team that works a lot on uh, partnerships, mergers, acquisitions with um, specifically healthcare technology companies. And then um, I also work closely with Tegria, which is um, one of the, which is the, um, the, the family of companies uh, which Lumetic uh, lives in. And I've been working really closely with Lumetic this past year um, on just sort of envisioning all the different use cases for blockchain and healthcare. 
and uh, and extremely uh, excited about the the concept of the um, vaccine credential for COVID, in addition to other applications of the technology moving forward. That's perfect. Thank you, Eddie. And uh, yeah, it, the world is going crazy at the moment for this tech, isn't it? It's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, it's good time so to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, overnight success, five years in the making. Um, Drummond, uh, onto yourself. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Drummond Reed, uh, Chief Trust Officer at uh, Evernim, and uh, uh, working heavily on on the underlying standards and protocols for everything we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm super pleased. I'm a co-editor of the DID Decentralized Identifier Specification at the W3C, and it was just uh, two days ago approved for what's called a transition to candidate recommendation which finishes a little over 18 months worth of work uh, to, uh, to finalize a specification that I've been working on for five years. So super happy about that. Um, I work heavily also on uh, the, the, the standards for, besides the technical side, the governance side and, uh, and, the, and the policy side. Um, Co-chair of the Governance Framework Working Group at the Sovereign Foundation have for I think four years and and more recently at the Trust RP Foundation I co-chaired the governance stack working group there where we are very focused on all the key policy issues of, around uh, using verifiable credentials and that's certainly what we're here to talk about today so really excited to be here. Cool thanks Drum. so we're amongst um, decentralized identity royalty at the moment I think we could safely say. Um, so just before we get started into the meat of it, um, please note this webinar has been recorded. Um, we'll send out the recording afterwards for people who registered, and it'll also be on our website as are all of our other uh, webinars, so evanim.com slash webinars. If you want to see that IATA one uh, last time around, that is well worth a watch. Um, as per usual, please put any questions you've got into the Zoom webinar Q&A, right? You'll see Q&A and there's also chat. Just don't use the chat, <laughs> use the Q&A, okay? Um, and behind the scenes, Alex gathers all the questions together for us. Um, we'll cover as many of them as possible after um, the, the formal presentation piece uh, of this session. We usually get like a load of questions, which is brilliant and we love it. Um, and we usually end up running longer. so. Um, you know, we're, li we're likely to run over, so if you want to hang on uh, the line um, after the hour, then please feel free to do that. Um, so to kick us off, we're going to hand over to Drummond first, uh, who's got a few slides, just to frame the key privacy issues with digital health credentials uh, that we've been brought together as a panel to discuss. So we've got a few slides, and then we're actually going to be um, uh, talking through this on a, on a panel perspective. So uh, Drummond, can I hand over to yourself? You bet, Andy. <clears throat> um, I have been very excited about this, uh, doing this panel for months now. And, and the reason is, uh, as I expect everyone watching this webinar already knows, verifiable digital credentials are the digital analog to the physical credentials that we pull out of our wallets every day to prove our identity, you know, someplace in our daily lives. At the airport, when we are still going to airports, um, car rental counters, hotels, or obviously in healthcare, at, at hospitals, doctors, offices, every place um, you need to, to, to prove your identity as you're receiving uh, health treatment. Um, and all of these credentials were physical or digital because of the fundamental trust triangle um, behind any credential. That's the, the next slide there, Andy. So, uh, and again, this is, this is you know, sort of the ABC, the verifiable credentials, they all have um, issuers <clears throat> um, that uh, issue the credential to the holder. In this case, uh, in the healthcare context, that would be um, a patient receiving care uh, of some kind. And <clears throat> um, they present it to uh, the third party in the triangle, the verifier, who needs to verify something about that. In this, in this diagram, we're showing the example of specifically a digital health pass credential that might need to go be shown to a verifier like the I, I had a travel pass to a verifier like an airport um, or, or, or an airline to, to, to board a plane. And uh, <clears throat> um, this, uh, uh, this whole uh, triangle works only if the verifier actually trusts the issuer of the credential. Um, and, and, and that trust relationship exists. And what's different about verifiable credentials is no actual integration is needed there at all. The verifier never needs to talk to the issuer nor needs to know, the issuer does not need to know that the verifier has been presented the credential. So with 
verifiable digital credentials. We're taking the whole process we use with physical credentials and we're replicating it with cryptography. The issuer needs to digitally sign the credential and the verifier will verify that digital signature in order to know that the credential um, is, is, is valid, it hasn't been tampered with, and it's been issued to that particular individual. Now, this is where the privacy challenges arise. Um, and and I, I like to point out, none of us complain today about the privacy of the physical credentials that we carry in our wallets, right? And, and, and ask yourself why? Well, first of all, we keep the credential safely in our own wallet. It doesn't sit out anyplace else in the world. There's no spying on that credential because it's in our wallet in our pocket. Secondly, we only pull it out to show it exactly when we need to, when we decide, ah, I need to show a credential here because the verifier needs to know something. And thirdly, the verifier can just look at the credential and verify it. They don't need to check back with the issuer, which means we're not being tracked when we use the credential, any credential in this wallet, okay? So uh, if you pop to the next slide, Andy, <coughs> This underscores the three basic privacy protections we need whenever we are, 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 are gonna be using uh, digital credentials, especially credentials with sensitive private uh, data like um, uh, personal health credentials. First of all, we need to be able to issue and store the credential privately in the holder's wallet, okay? So it's not out there in some, some database that can get um, 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 hacked. Uh, secondly, we need to give the holder control of what credential data is shown to whom and when. Just exactly, uh, in fact, we can do even better than you can do with a physical credential um, with, with what we call selective disclosure. And then thirdly, we got to ensure that there's no way for the holder to be tracked when they're using that credential, okay? Um, and I want to be very clear. We are at a huge inflection point for internet privacy with the introduction of digital credentials. Either we get privacy by design right now, or we're gonna lose the chance to ever get it right. That's why this, this webinar is so important. So, and if you <clears throat> pop to the last slide, I summarize it this way. And again, I've been working with the underlying technology for um, uh, digital credentials, verifiable credentials, and the identifiers they're used with, DIDs, you know, from the outset of both of these technologies. And this uh, spectrum uh, is, is, uh, is completely accurate. Um, <clears throat> the W3C standard for verifiable credentials, which Everton helped to write, it includes several choices for the format and the digital signature on a verifiable credential. And you don't have to read the bullets to get the basic uh, point of this, uh, of this slide. Verifiable credential technology can support the full spectrum of privacy, from highly privacy-preserving credentials on the far right to highly trackable credentials on the left. And, and, and there are cases for all of these. If you have a, a, a public organization issuer, a, a government, a, a corporation, a university, they need to be highly correlatable, understandable. You need to know that it's them if you're identifying them or they're providing their own credentials. But for individuals with uh, sensitive healthcare data, I think we need to be all the way on the right side. Uh, so- John, and, can I just jump in and just clarify sure. something there? You bet. So the same verifiable credentials um, structure, star, I hesitate to say standard, but um, you know, design, if you like, can be implemented is the implementation of that in multiple different ways that you're calling out here so if somebody says oh i support verifiable credentials they could be anywhere along this line right exactly you know that? that's okay. the point andy is that um we hear constantly in the market oh yeah i support the w3c standard that's not the <laughs> of course you need to do that that's how we get to eat a basic interoperability the question is where on this spectrum do you and most of what it comes down is the issuer right the issuer, unless the issuer issues a privacy preserving verifiable credential, it's not possible for the holder or verifier to, to, to preserve that. I mean, verifiers can do certain things on their own practices, but holders can only protect their, their, their uh, privacy if the issuer has issued what we call privacy preserving uh, verifiable credential. And that has to do with the identifier, um, the, the, whether or not zero knowledge cryptography is used and whether or not a privacy respecting protocol is used. And, you know, we're not gonna go deep into that here uh, today, but this, I, what I wanna make clear is Andy, uh, the, 
the, the ranges here and why, uh, as, as folks who, who know Evernim and listen to our webinars, we've been an advocate for this full range because for healthcare credentials, and, and I'm not the expert, that's why we have our other panelists here, Andy, to, to talk about their privacy requirements. Yeah, perfect, John. Thank you for that that intro. Let me just stop that share there. Um, okay, so fantastic stuff. I think um, this actually does cause or has caused confusion. You know, people say, "Oh, I'm, I support verifiable credentials," but what flavor? And also, how is the procurer of a verifiable credential system meant to, meant to know this stuff as well? Because it is quite deep down, isn't it? Um, but let's um, just ask that very question about uh, the requirements. Um, within people's organizations. And maybe if I can come to you first on this one, um, you know, working for, um, for Providence, uh, uh, what do you see the requirements are for, uh, for privacy in, in Providence and other healthcare providers as well? How do you see the world uh, evolving here? Well, I mean, privacy is critical to the foundational elements of a, re a trusting relationship between a patient um, and a provider. So if you can't get that right, you're going to affect the quality of care that you could provide because if a patient doesn't trust um, the privacy, their privacy when they're uh, engaging with a healthcare provider, they may not follow the instructions or they may not um, be compliant. Um, uh, they may question um, and they may be scared to go to a healthcare facility to seek care. So You've got to get that right. Um, there are lots of uh, <laughs> different ways that we try to tackle privacy as you, I mean, as for those of us that are from the US um, on this call, we have our HIPAA legislation that came into effect. Um, and in 2000, there were privacy rules. And in 2003, there were security rules. And then in 2009, there were breach notification rules that were added to that to really add all these layers of um, privacy considerations that we need to take into account when we're talking about digital patient data. Um, but it, it's, it's really challenging. It's a challenging environment. Um, uh, we also have lots of health information exchanges and exchange of information that are happening across organizations, which can benefit patients. But um, there are opportunities for um, errors to occur, or there's opportunities for potential breaches that put us at risk. And so we're dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and it's a constant, a constant challenge for us. And do you see, you know, with all these new regulations coming, and there's, there's got to be a challenge of translating those into this digital space. Right? Yeah. And, um, yeah, and also the way that the infrastructure is built and whether it's built in such a way to be able to be compliant with that. So, yeah. you know, we're constantly struggling with how do we ensure that's our cyber security component. You know, how do we ensure that the right people are looking in the patient's chart, not the wrong people? And how do you identify who the right people and the wrong people are? <laughs> I mean, yeah. and the digital trail that you have to keep of all the different um interactions that a caregiver may have with a patient's chart so it's it's a lot and it's a lot to track it's a lot to to um, keep track of as an organization there's a lot of resources that have to go into that yeah we've had actually strange enough similar conversations with quite a lot of banks uh, who've got you know swimming in a sea of regulation um, once they realize that the data itself can be the same as you would get on a piece of paper, but the bearer of the data is changing to a mm -hmm. digital bearer with a lot more security around it. There's like light bulb moments come on. Go, yeah. Oh, oh it's, so it's, it's the same data from the same places, but we've now got a secure cryptographic envelope that it sits in and mm -hmm. they kind of cheer up at that point. So <laughs> hopefully the same thing might happen. Um, that's cool, Evie. Thank you. Let's just uh, come on to Chris now from um, the perspective of, uh, the, the benefits for hospital and some hospitals and patients and um, what they can derive from a more kind of um, private and patient centric approach. Chris, do you want to just give us some comments on that? Sure. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the simple thesis and hope that we have is that um, by providing individuals with more and better information within their own control, we can improve uh, the patient health journey. Today, uh, at least in the US, when you talk to patients about, um, uh, about their own health care, they're confused sort, sort of about 
everything, right? We're confused about um, our health benefits and HSA versus FSA versus HRA versus PPO, right? Where, where people are, are confused about how to find in-network providers. If they're getting a procedure, they're confused about how to make sure that on that day that's scheduled in the future, not just all the providers, but also the facility, the anesthesiologist, all of these people um, are all in network providers, so they don't get these surprise bills. Um, um, people don't understand what care is going to cost them before they have care, so they're accepting something without really good estimates. When they ask organizations to provide an estimate, they sort of get fingers pointed, well, you need to talk to your payer to get some information. And so all of this is very confusing, at least in the U.S., in terms of trying to navigate your own personal health journey. And, and all of that, I think, or a lot of that is because in the past, the interoperability, the information was exchanged between payers and providers. And the, and the patients were a bit like the kids at the kids table where mommy and daddy are talking and we'll yeah. let you know later. So and it's all so, happening kind of behind the scenes. It's not visible to the person. There's, there's yeah, for, for a lot of really good reasons. Yeah, yeah, for a lot of really good reasons in the past where, where when patients didn't have the liability that they do today. And so it was, we're gonna keep all this mess from you. Don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. Today, as patient liabilities are increasing, patients are starting to ask more questions and therefore they need more information. And so we, we think that by providing um, patients with their own health information, they then can serve as the intermediary between the payers and providers or HCOs to start to ask and get answers to the questions that in the past we had to do these awkward kind of round trip discussions, which caused a lot of time and delay and confusion. And so we think that's going to be everything from um, they're, they're going to understand their insurance coverage and benefits better. We think people are going to be better able to find the right providers and, and better able to do um, scheduling and, and check in and registration and cost estimates and pay for care and, and the whole nine yards. And so um, we think in terms of the, the aspect of the financial journey that patients go through today, um, most of that can be improved with verifiable credentials. Right, and that's, that's really interesting. So the person's much more involved in the process in that they have the data. I mean, maybe the big innovation here is that previously, if you gave the person some digital data of that sort, they could edit it and change it, right? Whereas now the innovation is that you can give them the data, they can provide it, and the recipient can know that it's, it's genuine and authentic. It hasn't been changed on, on the way through. Yeah, and the other aspect of this that I didn't even get into, which, which is more Evie's world, and there's a huge set of things that we can do from a clinical perspective to improve the care of, of people as well and to get people more engaged in their healthcare um, because they have a better understanding of, of what's going on. So I think yeah, yeah. both sides of that, their navigation of the journey as well as improvement of care, um, both will be impacted by this. Right. So really interesting. I mean, the, the next uh, question is coming over to Christine actually about, you know, what these requirements look like on a global scale. How do you incorporate this for something like, you know, you look at the IR to travel pass where they're going, people be flying to different countries all around the world with different regimes, you know, like US things sound scary because in the UK, we just go to the NHS and it's free, right? Um, but different countries are all very, very different. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say it's free, it's included. <laughs> <laughs> in the tax take. Um, so Christine, when, when you're looking at scaling up something mm. like this, how, how do you get your head around it with all the different regs and different privacy controls that you, you'd have to manage, not least the technical, the technology piece? Yes, I, I think the technology piece is probably the easier part in many ways. Yeah. Um, uh, the concept of uh, uh, privacy is fairly culture dependent uh, in, in my sort of 20 years of working in sort of infosec and privacy and, you know, uh, um, and of course now decentralized identity. Um, and there are different perceptions of what's private to one culture may not be so in, in others. So the different requirements, um, the ability to have that flexibility to, de um, to deliver what is private in one sector or one country um, and what is not in others and the level of assurance that's needed for different industries. So for example, in border control, you will have to have uh, in order for a credential to be accepted, um, is, uh, uh, that aspects of assurance of the identity is very stringent. Typically in health, 
um, it's not so much because the incentives are very different. Uh, in, um, so the aspects of how much data you need in one context versus another is very different. So the aspects of how much data can I share, how much should I share, how much is it really needed, and the aspects of uh, who I'm sharing that with, that level of trust and privacy would be would be very different. So the uh, what that it means to underline technology stack is the flexibility. Like what Drummond showed earlier, I love the diagram of that spectrum, um, is that the aspects, well, some countries are going to have much more um, uh, 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 stringent requirements around privacy and some individuals themselves who are going to be more conscious. So therefore, solutions and um, need to adapt to those cultures, need to adapt to those requirements. And what is considered private today may not be so in 10 years. So how do we ensure that um, solutions that are built today can accommodate the changing notion of privacy? And you know, a, a great example is that when people put in biometrics 20 years ago, they think, well, you know, that people wouldn't uh, envision what it can be used and how to use the uh, technology uh, in a responsible manner to ensure that the, uh, the use of tracking uh, that for nefarious means must be responsibly controlled and, and thinking through. But it's not to say that the, the technology isn't valuable. It's hugely valuable, but it must be used in a responsible manner to ensure that there is privacy to protect the individual and accommodate to the different flavors uh, and requirements of privacy globally, because what works in Asia may not work in the UK, definitely may not work in the US, and that yeah. notion is very different from place to place. So, um, so how would you kind of um, manage that then, right? So if you, you let's say the technology, you know, we know it allows you to move verifiable credentials around, hold them and present them in privacy preserving ways and so on. But for the recipient, how do they know that um, the the COVID test credential you're giving them has come from a lab that they should trust and it's not like Andy's corner test lab that I've set up for 50 pound a time uh, how can that kind of thing work so you get trust at a, at a global scale I, I think that's a, a really interesting question we all know uh, that we've seen in the news that uh, there are a ton of fake certificates out there already and it's not so much just a fake certificate, but think of, we are all still, or many of us, like you and me are in London, we are still in lockdown. Um, the, the impact on public health, right? If there is a fake credential, everyone gets yeah. on the plane and there's one person with a fake credential that's, that, and they, they are positive mm -hmm. and lead to a super spreader event, that's, you know, monumental um, and huge amount of risk. So how can we enable that trust? I think it's also, it's, trust needs to be in many ways uh, how do we ensure that there is a trust of that, um, you know, boots or whatever that's been te testing me, that is a real credential, it's not just a fake piece of paper, yeah. uh, paper. that aspects of the um, and onboarding uh, of those organizations, whether it's a pharmacy, whether it's an NHS trust, whether it's a, uh, the, uh, the local doctors, onboarding of those organizations, the aspects of organization trust, um, getting the government uh, in different places to be part of this, to actually foster, um, they might not have to do anything, but fostering the concepts of, look, we need digital trust. Uh, however, the market does it is one thing, but that aspects of getting the government involved to ensure that just like how we set up a company today, we have to go through those processes to prove yeah. that the company is real, to set up the bank account, to pay taxes, all of those proof points needs to be digitalized to ensure that this isn't Andy's special, you know, uh, uh, vaccine hut. Uh, it is the real, you know, uh, uh, um, um, uh, authority that's doing the vaccination yeah. or doing the PCR test or whatnot to ensure that there is real trust. Well, maybe actually so I, um, I can come to you, Eddie, on, on that particular question. So as you know, a large healthcare provider at Providence, um, let's say you've got to rely on credentials that people are, are presenting to you. You know, are you going to have like a list of approved issuers or something like that? Have you, have you sort of thought about how that, yeah, how would yeah, you know I mean, that somebody we, coming from Malaysia is, how do you know their lab is good, for example? Yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if I can speak as much to the international uh, components to it, but that is an interesting uh, question. But we deal with this on a regular basis with our caregivers and our providers when it comes to credentialing. So, um, you know, if a, if a physician or a nurse needs to go and work in a hospital or a facility, 
they have a whole bunch of what we call our accordion file, like literally it's an accordion file of paperwork that we then have to present. And then there's primary source verification that takes place where they go back and they say, okay, here's a copy of your medical degree. Now we're going to actually verify at the source of truth that that yeah. is really your medical degree. So, I mean, we deal with this all the time. It's very cumbersome. It's a very burdensome process. If there was a way to streamline that, and during COVID, this came out as being a screaming opportunity because we needed mobility of our workforce and they were not very mobile because we had to go through this arduous process in order to move people around, especially when we had an entire team of nursing wiped out at a, at a skilled nursing facility because there was a COVID outbreak and we didn't have anybody to take care of these patients. So that is like one use case that where there's a huge yeah. opportunity to streamline. Yeah, well, I completely agree on that one. I, I see there are some of my good friends from the UK National Health Service on board who are doing exactly that. Um, so maybe I can come to you, Chris, on this one as well. Um, you know, you're, you're seeing something much broader. There's this kind of short term COVID credentials. Everyone's excited about COVID credentials, right? But you're seeing a much bigger picture that relies on you know, privacy preserving digital data, essentially, aren't you? So just kind of bring in some of the other opportunities around transforming healthcare. You've got the, the mobility, the staff mobility thing that Eddie's mentioned. Sure, yeah. So you're, you're exactly right, Andy. When we started out working on bringing verifiable credentials to healthcare, um, this was a few years ago, the pandemic wasn't a reality. And so what we were looking at is use cases where a patient intermediated information exchange could offer benefits to both the patient and the operational infrastructure, right? I think the US, I, I think they say we waste something close to $300 billion a year or something on administrative loss on all of this information exchange and interoperability problems. And wow. so there's a huge opportunity for improvement and, and, and it doesn't take very long um, in your exploration to, to quickly identify a bunch of these use cases. And, and I talked about some today around registration and, 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 um, and coverage information and these kinds of things. So the, the, the information exchange between payers and providers as an example. And so when we started to build all of that out, um, it, 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 it was logical for people within Providence to ask us, hey, now that you can do this with things like insurance coverage information, can't you do this for um, COVID test results and vaccinations and these things? And, and the answer is yes, which is why we built and deployed that um, at, at Providence. But along the way, what we discovered is that um, this gets at your other question, which is a governance structure. You, you can't build these kinds of things in isolation. You need a community effort to do this. And so um, we, we are involved in organizations like the Trust Over IP Foundation, where we are building a, uh, I mentioned the, uh, we're sort of a co-convener with a couple of organizations on this community. Um, and it's a healthcare community to define the, the use cases, the technical standards and the governance frameworks around exchanging the information. And so the hope is that if you build these ecosystems in such a way, um, you can do it to provide some level of trust to the other parties such that, um, it, somebody in, in Croatia that is looking to accept a vaccination credential from the, de, the Department of Health in the state of Washington, they have no technical infrastructure, they have no pre-existing trust relationship, but yet because of some know. governance structures and, and reciprocity yeah. agreements between different organizations, they can rest assured that the that the trust exists and that there's been vetting and that it's not Bob's vaccine factory um, that's providing this information. And so this is one of the reasons that we developed this community because we believe that that's the way we're gonna go tackle this thing together. Um, and, and so that's why both of these things we feel like have to have to work together. Yeah, that's that's great, Chris. I, I think um, you, know, you mentioned Trust Over IP as did Drummond. I encourage everyone on the webinar to, to look at trustoverip.org where you'll see um, a twin stack model. You've got the technology stack and you've got the governance stack. 
and you need both of those right we can talk about zero knowledge proofs till we're blue in the face and we probably will do a little bit more coming on <laughs> but unless you've got the governance piece it's not going to work and that you know that's something really significant that IATA have, have brought to the table is that they they're providing governance they they maintain the uh, the list of government approved labs that can issue you know uh, test credentials as an example um, so that kind of thing that enabling the governance so the recipient can trust where the data come from is is hugely important um, not only do you need the privacy bit but you need to make sure that it's secure and what comes out the other end is trustworthy um, either saying with this stuff um, you know verifiable credentials you could have crap in and verifiable crap out right <laughs> you've got to make sure you get the right stuff in in the first place um so let's uh, there's some really good questions coming in actually thank you we're going to cover as many of them as we can do um let's just ask this one who is this one from um actually there's a couple here actually um from emo for um emo hi thanks for asking this one um how do you prevent users from sharing or selling their credentials? If a credential is untrackable, how do you limit abuse or misuse? Uh, Drummond, you've been a bit quiet, suspiciously so. Do you want to cover that one? Yeah, that is uh, more of a technology question than a policy question. And um, <clears throat> there are answers all the way across the spectrum, but I'm going to focus on the privacy preserving uh, credentials because that's where people sometimes say, well, if you can uh, you know, if you can protect your privacy, well, then, you know, you can just, you can't really tell that someone else is using the credential. Actually, the irony is it's completely the inverse. <clears throat> In order to issue, uh, and I won't go into the details, but to issue this privacy preserving credential, it uses zero knowledge proof. It's actually um, issued to uh, a unique and never shared called serial number in, in your wallet. And by serial number, it's not something any, it's, it's literally buried down in your digital wallet. You don't even know it, right? You can't share it because you never see it, but it's essentially a cryptographic secret. And that credential will only work in that wallet and only that one wallet can ever share a proof of that credential. Um, this is not true for other credentials that are not privacy preserving. They don't have that uh, characteristic. So that's only the first of, of a number of ways that we uh, call identity binding, which is how, how that credential is bound to you as a physical indivi individual. The more assurance you need when you're presenting that credential, the uh, more types of identity binding you might have. I, I, you know, Classic example is a credential might carry a biometric just the way our you know, passports and, and driving licenses have pictures of us. Um, digitally, we have multiple ways to do that um, besides you know, that basic cryptography. The idea is that with privacy preserving credentials, those options are available and the verifier only chooses what they really need. And you decide, okay, do I want to share a picture or do I want to uh, use a biometric to verify that I'm currently the one using that wallet? All of those things can strongly bind the credential and still be privacy preserving. Okay, very cool. I mean, there's there's a, a world of detail on this, and actually, the devil is in the detail, or the benefits are in the detail, aren't they? So, people need to, um, uh, unfortunately, you know, the, the tech is really important. People do need to know what you need to do to get on the green side of the privacy preserving verifiable credentials piece, don't they? Um, okay, so some other questions. Oh, should we tackle this one? <laughs> It's the inclusion question. Um, now, I'm looking at Evie for this one. Evie, would you be all right to, you know, what's the question? Well, it could be like, there's 50 million questions on this, right? But if you, <laughs> you know, do you need uh, the latest iPhone or Galaxy S21? And what if you haven't got one and et cetera? Yeah, so what yeah, no, it's a really good question. And um, it's definitely a hot topic. It's definitely something that we've thought about. Um, both as we actually in our Lumetic exchange that we've set up with other company collab that were companies that we're collaborating with and institutions we're collaborating with, we actually have a work group specifically focused on health equity because we need to make sure that we're, for, we're putting that first and foremost um, in our thought process when we're thinking about how to responsibly, um, responsibly scale this, uh, this technology. I will say that, I mean, there's a couple things that kind of go through my mind. I know there's a lot of controversy around the concept of a vaccine passport. You know, um, what does that do yep. from a civil liberties perspective? Is that the right direction to go? 
Um, but you know, we're not the policymakers, um, and and in anticipation of what we are seeing happening in the global community, we knew that this was something that was probably going to happen um, in order to allow for families to reunite, for the global economy to reopen, and for people to be able to travel. We needed to enable with the tools that they needed. We needed to enable our patients to be able to do what they needed to do to be able to travel. And so that's why we really thought, you know, it's important for us to start thinking about creating this for our patients. When it comes to the equity um, question, there, there's no doubt that there are challenges. There are communities um, in both the United States and globally um, in, in other nations where there are haves and haves nots when have nots when it comes to vaccines and the vaccination rates do um, vary. And that is something that we need to think about both as healthcare organization, as a company with, you know, with Lumetic and with our, our governments um, and, and the policymakers to think about how we partner together to tackle that and address it. And then on the other, on the flip side, there is one other issue that we've talked about as well. And that is with um, some folks in, in other countries, specifically refugee communities, um, underserved communities, they don't have identification or sometimes yeah. it's very hard to identify these folks. And there's paperwork that gets stuffed away in a shelf and it's really hard to find. And so having a way to digitally identify these people could actually help them in, you know, from an equity perspective in the future. So um, you know, think about it in that regard as well, because there are big challenges with some of those communities. Yeah, I think that's, that's really insightful, Libby. Thank you. I, and I don't know, you can have different views on it. Here we, here we are in the UK and like everyone's got 14 smartphones and so on, right? Um, it's not the case everywhere by any means. So we do have to broaden our minds somewhat. I was just wondering, Christine, um, you know, the, the Accenture International Global Company, you're seeing activity around digital credentials around the world. How, how do you see this? Have you seen any kind of solutions to like, can you print credentials or you know, how, what are you seeing around the inclusion question as well? I think the, um, the inclusion angle is significant. And um, I, uh, it's, I do a lot of work in the social impact space, working with a number of our clients that, uh, that uh, uh, support refugees in those uh, communities uh, globally. I think um, we need to, any solution that we, uh, we have, need to have that aspect of redress. Uh, how do people uh, handle um, uh, points of complaints, points of redress? How do we ensure that solutions are not just smartphone? Uh, how can we have those delegated uh, organizations to help with individuals who are not necessarily very tech uh, uh, savvy um, and understand that there are always gonna be dynamics and uh, aspects of designing the solution that they can um, intuitively understand. Whilst uh, all of us here on, on the panel can understand the, the essentials of uh, um, uh, SSI and all, all of the different permutations of how different things work, that um, most people don't care about that, none should they. Yeah. So yeah. how can we, design solutions that are human centric, that are um, able to have the right experiences for those that are tech, a bit more tech savvy and can use Instagram and whatnot to the, the grannies and the um, uh, that are not necessarily going to be very comfortable with the technology and and also for the healthcare professionals that are actually focusing on testing us, vaccinating us, uh, taking care of us that are they, they shouldn't be fiddling with all this tech. It needs to be simple. So I think for um, the technologists to be working closely hand in hand with uh, a lot of the design thinking folks to make this experience right, I think is really critical and embedding the concept of privacy as part of that journey so that it's not such a pain to have to keep clicking and and people get that ah i need to be trained on that privacy educating yeah. people that this is going to help me with my privacy but make it simple um, make it less painful to use uh, yeah. and that that's really also part of the uh, the aspects of of improving the experience and inclusion yeah, I think that's a really good point, actually, is getting it right from the start. And just because somebody hasn't got a smartphone, you shouldn't compromise their privacy. And also, you know, because somebody may be desperate for something like um, um, 
refugee aid, for example, you can't take advantage of that, you know, either. So you have to get that privacy respecting nature in, you know, right from the start. So I, I think that's, that's really good. Um, so let me come on um, a whole a bunch of other questions that we've coming in as well, but I'm just, this one is a bit more, um, because we're on the concept of privacy and um, whenever we, we say like global unique identifier in the SSI world, people start sort of shaking and shivering and foaming at the mouth and, and so on. So let me just run this one by you. Um, there's some recent documents from the European Union on the guidelines on proof of vaccination for medical purposes. Um, and this is part of what's looking like the European Union Green Pass Initiative, which is at the moment, it's kind of specs for how, you know, what test credentials and vax credentials might look like. Um, so they propose a unique vaccination certification identifier to be included within any issued certificate of vaccination. So that would be like a digital one or a paper one, I guess, um, would be unique across all the EU member states uh, and support the interoperability of vaccine certificates. Um, presumably, it would allow you to link to a country's or a provider's vaccination status database or something like that. So um, what do we think of a unique identifier in this context? And I'm going to, well, Drummond's off mute. So Drummond, this is coming your way then. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to start out again. I'm going to speak to uh, sort of the, the, the technical component because I think this is also a, a major you know, policy and, and governance framework piece. Um, there are good reasons to have such an identifier in order to be very, very specific about exactly the vaccine you you received, and and you know both for for you know your own health protection and then the tracking uh, of the eff eff efficacy. And I have to say that word very often um, of of uh, vaccinations. Um, but from a privacy standpoint, it is another globally unique identifier that's now going to be in your credential. And uh, for me, that's, again, a flag. We want to be all the way over at this end. <clears throat> if, that's, if that's required, as, as it looks like it will be in the, in, in the Green Pass in the EU, it's another reason that we want to be using uh, privacy-preserving credentials, your knowledge cryptography, so that you have the ability to selectively disclose it. In other words, only a small set of verifiers are actually going to need to know that number, right? Maybe yeah. to cross a border or something like that. That's when you that would be shared. The vast majority of the rest, they only need to know you got a vaccination. Maybe you got a vaccination of a particular type. They don't need that globally unique identifier, and they shouldn't get it um, as another piece of information that could be used to track you. So uh, again, it's just another case for that. Now the the otherwise the 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 call it pressure on the verifiers uh, to to do the right thing in terms of what they're asking for um, that. I think comes from the policy side and governance frameworks that are designed to, to, you know, boost people's uh, confidence that they're only going to be asked by these large, you know, frankly verifiers that have a lot more power in the market than they do, um, to to only, uh, uh, you know, only ask for the information they need. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think. Um... Yeah. There, there, there is a sort of shiver runs through anyway when someone says a globally unique identifier, but. If there's governance around it about how it's used and you can recognize as a person that the whoever's asking you to share it is legit you know because authentication here should go both ways right um then used in the right way it looks like it's it's doable um, and can i point out one thing that a yeah. lot of folks don't realize <clears throat> when that when they're worried about oh, i've got now digital credentials and so i can be you know sort of papers please right uh, every place I go, they can just say, hey, show me your credentials, right? Because it's yeah. just one click. Here's the inverse of that. That request for you to share your credentials is also digitally verifiable, right? You can basically say, ah, can you sign your request? Because if that's the case, if that verifier is asking for information they're not supposed to, their liability is ginormous, right? Yeah. It's as in, Hey world, I am violating this legislation, or I'm violating this, uh, you know, uh, my own privacy policy, or whatever it is, right? So, people think, ah, oh, if I have digital credentials, I'm, you know, over, uh, I, I'm exposing this data. Well, actually, you're in the, you know, as long you're actually protecting the ability to, to only have to share that data when you need to in a powerful new way, as long as folks understand the whole the whole trade-off. Well, that, yeah, I was actually going to come on to Chris on, on that particular topic, actually, Drummond, because um, 
you know, Chris, imagine the scenario, right, that we're all envisaging where it's, it's two or three seconds just to prove who you are, to, to do something, you'll get something. Do you think that that will result in behaviors where, because it's so easy, right, it's convenient for me, but it's also mega convenient for any organization that wants to ask you anything. So whereas previously we could go around being relatively anonymized, do you think there's going to be like a creeping um, kind of check it all the time and we're just bombarded with requests from everything? What do you think on that, Chris? I think it's a good question. I don't actually know the answer, but I know that a lot of people are concerned about that as well as um, individuals' decision-making around what information they choose to share with different parties. And I think there was a question about this earlier, which is, um, you know, there, there's there's a bit of hand-wringing right now um, in, in the U.S. after this 21st Century Cures Act regulation where individuals have the right for all their, their personal health information. We're going to give it to them, but what are they going to do with it? And are there going to be unscrupulous actors and vendors out there that are going to take a page from social media to monetize your personal information? And in the past, when we observe individual behavior, certain individuals in our society are pretty cavalier about their privacy. So yeah. I'm willing to give you everything about myself in order to use your services. If there are organizations that are set up um, as part of this to, to ask for that same social contract with people, the healthcare organizations who have been you know stalwarts for years around, we don't share any of your personal information. And when we do, there's steep penalties. Now suddenly we're going to give it to people and just hope and expect that they treat it um, securely. And so I, I don't know how this is going to shake out, but That's I think there, there's a fair amount of concern now around, um, around that. Now I will say in the domain space in which we operate, which is around healthcare, healthcare organizations, privacy thinking has, you know, that's the way they think already. So for them, it's important that this new pattern doesn't take a step back relative to privacy and just maintains this level of, of boundary. And so the information exchange within healthcare with verifiable credentials, I think makes sense for a lot of folks. And it's one of the reasons that healthcare, not known for moving very quickly, is actually moving fairly quickly in this domain because there isn't a, um, a pre-existing conflict of interest around the, you know, healthcare organizations don't monetize people's data today the way other industries do. And so yeah, now so I think that. this possibly opens this door and people are a little bit concerned about what vendors are gonna, you know, now ask for mm. And I'm gonna, you know, give me your health information and I'm gonna help you with your workout regimen. And I'm also gonna do a whole bunch of other stuff and monetize it. And so um, I, I well, there's nervousness there. Yeah, and let's throw that one over to Evie as well, because, you know, there's barriers at the moment in terms of kind of cost and complexity of verifying data from someone. Like it might cost you know, more of my experience in the banking world, like £10, £15, £20 to, to check someone to onboard them for an account. But if it costs like two cents and you can do it in 10 seconds, that's going to change a whole load of dynamics. I mean, what do you think, Evie? Yeah, and I mean, I, I was listening to Chris because there's obviously the predatory behaviors that can occur um, that we are concerned about, but I guess I'm sort of a little more pie in the sky when I think about it, and I think about it more from the aspect of like, how could this change research, for example, because now right. you're not bound within the institution um, and the patients within your healthcare organization, you have the potential to unlock insights from patients who engage in, um, in, in this technology and make themselves available potentially. They can decline a request or they can accept a request. But when we think about rare diseases and the, the, the administrative burden associated with disease registry inputs and um, the shareability of that information, being able to kind of almost connect that ecosystem mm -hmm. of whether it's pharma or non-pharmacological therapies and approaches and being able to connect a broader patient population that also takes into account the diversity of a broad patient population because when it's institutional or geographically focused, you don't always get that perspective. I think there's huge potential, but to, to your point and to Chris's point, um, 
you know, the proof is in the pudding and it could be overwhelming for patients um, if they're getting asked things constantly. Um, and, and so we need to be thoughtful about how yeah. we approach that. Yeah, I can just see people, you know, um, ask you, can you share your, all your vaccine history to see these fluffy cat videos, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I'll just note, we're coming up to the hour. There's like about another million questions. We could probably do a few more. Are you guys okay to hang on maybe another 10, 15 minutes? Is that right? Cool. <laughs> Um, let's do that because there's a lot coming in. So maybe I can just bring another one back on um, uh, about, maybe um, over to you, Christine. Uh, um, you must, at Accenture, you must get approached by all sorts of organizations and governments that have heard about, I don't know, IR to travel pass or heard about verifiable credentials and they have like a, a smattering of information about it. How do you go about kind of conveying in a way that they're going to understand these issues around privacy that we're talking about without using the word zero knowledge proof at any point? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, we very often try to put this into something that's relatable. Uh, and I often use the example that, uh, well, I like to go and I, I, ha I have to have lifelong medication. And at times when you go and pick up your prescription, they ask you your name, your address, your date of birth. Oh, are you taking these drugs for your this condition? Really, the whole of the pharmacy does not need to know what drugs I'm taking, um, yeah. uh, my my name, my date of birth, or my address. So think of, and and make the story relatable to the individuals rather than saying, well, with zero knowledge proof or selective disclosure, this is what you can do, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. because oh, you know, what is zero knowledge proof? Well, what if I can say to the client or indeed my counterparts in, in Accenture that what if I can go into the pharmacy and say, uh, is this, I'm picking up a prescription. They need to ask me a question and I can just say yes or no. And, yeah. and typically that makes it much easier for people to understand and put it into the context of what could be the case. What if I go back into the office and say, right, have you been tested in the last four days? Uh, whatever the rule may be, and different countries will have different rules. Have you been vaccinated in, uh, 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 and tested uh, if I were to cross borders? And those are the only things that they need to know. So for example, if I'm getting on an airline, going back into the office, going to a big event, those are things they need to know. They don't need to know what's my name and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and date of birth. And so I, so those it, are I mean, the it, I have to do. Yeah, and I know you've got to go, Christine, but I think that's that's really insightful, actually, sort of explaining it to people. You know, when you're talking to a government, you're still talking to people who have to go to the pharmacy to collect stuff, right? So talk to them in their own terms. I think it's fantastic. Um, all right, Christine, if you've got a drop, that's cool. Um, if uh, Chris and Evie and Drummond are okay, I'll just stay on for another couple of mins. Um, there's a lot of questions coming out about interoperability, um, which is natural because it is it, there's it's a huge area, right? As Drummond said, there's different flavors of verifiable credentials of different ways DIDs work and all this. I kind of propose we don't go into that in a huge level of detail here. We should actually um, do more on interoper uh, uh, from a webinar perspective anyway. What I'd just like to do, and there's there a question from Alan Sheriff. Hi, Alan, um, about the different flavors of verifiable credentials and this is acronym rich, like JSON, JWT, JSON LD, JSON J, um, LD plus BBS, blah. Who this Jason guy is, I don't know. But anyway, um, if I can just point people at an amazing paper written by a lady called Kalia Young, otherwise known as Identity Woman, it's called The Different Flavors of Verifiable Credentials. It explains it, um, it's epically good. Um, so it looks like, um, this uh, Jason LD plus uh, with BBS plus is is looking favourite at the moment, so uh, keep an eye on that. Um, but maybe Alex, you could dig out the link for that and drop it in the chat somewhere. Um, let's just do um, another one that doesn't have acronyms in it or or zero knowledge proofs in it. Um, right. So Raman, so, hi Raman says, uh, is it fair to say this is all this being discussed is for a post pandemic scenario? Um, Oof, uh, Evie, post-pandemic scenario, is there ever going to be a post-pandemic scenario? We're just in it forever. <laughs> it's interesting. My husband's a physician as well. We were talking about this this morning because the variants, you know, the news comes out about the variants. I think it's going to be an ongoing situation where we're going to get the, the waves um, 
we'll probably have boosters that we'll have to take uh, and track over time. Yep. Um, I do think we will get to a place where life will become more normal. We also talked about like, have we eradicated the influenza? Um, <laughs> yeah, because nobody's, nobody's going because anywhere of to COVID, go. Because yeah. I mean, I don't even know if there'll be a new flu vaccine because we really have a flu wave, but um, I mean, yeah, I think that having the ability to demonstrate um, the trust in the information um, from a public health and safety perspective will allow us to um, re-engage as a, as a global society. So I, I do see the, the post-pandemic, I see this technology facilitating us in that post-pandemic scenario, getting to the new normal, which probably yeah exactly the way things were before but better than what it was this past year <laughs> yeah that's that's awesome I, I think um we should have you on all the time maybe because you're so optimistic it's fantastic um I think the um we, you know I've been working in this world of dids and verifiable credentials and stuff for like five years or so now and um this COVID situation has been a massive accelerant for change right mm -hmm. a lot of these things we've been thinking about were happening anyway and then boom, here's this huge problem that needs solving and people look for a solution and it's sitting there in, in, in this form of digital credentials. Um, and Chris, Chris, what's your view on, on this? Is it, you know, as we yeah, come out of the pandemic, if we ever do? Yeah, I, um, I think I would say that we were a little bit surprised and um, not anticipating the need to take health information outside of the healthcare industry, right? Our, our, yeah. our business, when we started working on all of this, it had nothing to do with COVID. And so it was all around improving healthcare information exchange. The, the idea that you can take your health information into other industry contexts like global travel or venues or whatever it is, was, was not something we had considered. I think what it does is it, it sort of, to your point, um, accelerates this this idea that um, that we will be using verifiable credentials from different industries to have access to new you know kinds of services in in um, in ways that you know what we would call compound proofs right something from this yeah. industry and something from this industry together to provide information to access something in a new way. I think that that gets exciting um, in that there are probably um, businesses and problems and, and services that are going to be available to people um, that were previously not available because this information was all locked away in different industries. And now we're going to put it yeah. in people's hands and they can use it to do something. And so um, I think the post-pandemic world, I, I hope that this idea of immunity passports, whether people are on board or not have it forced people to digest the idea of of taking your information around with you portably in a way yeah. that you can prove something without a bunch of expensive technical infrastructure existing at the relying parties that kind of idea is really powerful if you start to get multiple issuers giving you this information and so that's not just healthcare um, and, and I think healthcare yeah. is, 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 will be an interesting part of that and, and an interesting um, uh, demonstrator of that pattern. Yeah, I, so I think you've really um, put your finger on another of the, the really key innovations here. We talked earlier about the fact that um, now a person can carry some digital data and, and the recipient, when you prove something, they can confirm it's authentic, right? That in itself is a huge innovation. But the other innovation is, is the person becomes the courier of the data across all these previously locked silos. So now you can innovate and do things that you could never have done before because you'd have to spend millions trying to knit all these systems together. Now you're, you're kind of outsourcing <laughs> the API to the person. The person carries the data and they present it wherever they want. And you, suddenly you get a whole bunch of new processes and methods of doing things that couldn't have existed before. And there's gonna be huge innovation there. And, and just your point of, healthcare coming out of the healthcare world into other places because you can do that. I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, as long as it's done in the right way and privacy preserving and there's no kind of huge central database that tracks everything you do, right? Um, okay, very valid. I think we'll wrap it up there. We're, uh, we're 10 minutes there. We've still got a load of questions, um, including 
Um, really good one from uh, Lou Zurowski. Hey, Lou. Uh, I used to work with Lou like 30 years ago. <laughs> Um, who's asking about some, um, there's just stuff we haven't got time to go, but you know, an internationally branded trust mark for credential exchange. Well, I think Lou, that one it, for air travel, that'll be IATA, right? Um, but really good point about another 30, 40 questions we just haven't got time to go into, but um, I'd like to say really huge thanks to Christine who's, who's gone. Uh, Evie, fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Uh, thank you for helping out with this one. Uh, Chris as well, very informative and drummer as ever, the father of decentralized identifiers. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for um, all participating with us. Thanks for the, the loads and loads of people who joined as well and asked such good questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. We tried really hard. Um, keep an eye out for the next webinar coming up. I'm not sure exactly what it's going to be because it's changing so quickly at the moment. Um, but uh, again, thank you everyone for taking part. And Andy, I, I want to put in just a push. I, I think we've got enough requests for one that's just about uh, uh, zero knowledge cryptography and the differences between the different uh, types and, and the interest in BBS plus coming up. So I'm pretty sure we're going to be doing that relatively soon. So just if folks are interested in that, keep an eye on uh, the Evernim webinar uh, announcements. Yeah, sounds like a good plan. All right, folks, uh, thanks all very much indeed. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. See you later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Evie. Thanks, Chris.